there's a feeling that you don't have enough time, you don't have enough resources, you don't have enough but capability. Often you, you never have to say it because if you speak comprehensively enough about all that you do know, don't look at the one blemish that's going away in five days anyway. If you have good. Welcome to How to Be an Adult, a podcast created by the practitioners at the Morpheus Clinic for Hypnosis in Toronto, Canada. This is a show for people just like you who've inadvertently become adults and don't know what to do about it. Whether you're 18 or 80, this is the trail guide to life that no one gave to you when you gain equality with your parents. We share our thoughts publicly so that we can democratize self-assurance, self-love, and self-respect. I'm Luke Chow, and this will be a solo show as Pascal is out of town. In this episode, I'm going to take a side in the eternal glass half full, glass half empty debate. Often these two sides are presented as equally valid, but I'm going to make the case today that a correct view of the glass is that it's half full. And any view of that glass as half empty comes from someone who had gotten distracted from the entire point of having a glass in the first place. Another way to state this point is that you can only make a meal with the ingredients that you do have. It would be fruitless if you're standing in your kitchen, you've got enough ingredients to make a thousand dishes, and you're wishing for other ingredients. That's not how a meal is made. A third metaphor I'll make to make the same point is that you could only paint a painting of something you see, either in your mind's eye or in reality. It's literally impossible to make a painting of anything that you can't either see in reality or imagine. I could go on with metaphors, but I, I think you understand the point. A correct view of reality accounts for what is, and without much distraction by all the infinite things that are not so. I'll expand a little bit more about what I mean by a glass half full and a glass half empty view. A glass half full view is one where you are looking at and accounting for and recognizing all that is, all that already does exist or all that you do have. Contrast this with a glass half empty view where you're ignoring all that you have and all that is to look at all that you don't have. So in other words, all that you could have, all that someone else has and that you don't. These are thoughts that sound like what if, or how about, or I could have, I would have, I should have, I might have. All these kinds of thoughts are distracted from what is. I know that so many of the listeners to this podcast have minds that are full of these what if or should have and could have and would have thoughts, especially if you're dealing with anxiety and especially if you're dealing with depression. That's why I stated so forcefully my thesis at the start of this episode that a correct view of you or a correct view of the world or of your life is a glass half full view. I'll make the bold claim that a full accounting of all that you do have will probably make you happier. A glass half full view does a full accounting of all that you do have. Let's apply this to, let's say, wealth, right? So, so often we look at the next person and they have a bigger house than us. They have a fancier make of automobile than we have, or it seems like they've gone on more vacations than we have. If you get distracted by all that you don't have, you aren't looking at, let's say, the car you have, or the wealth you have, or all that you do have. Certainly, if you're listening to me right now, th there are things you have that a monk somewhere else in the world does not have. I understand that this raises the concern of, well, what if we get complacent? I'm going to address this by the end of the episode. Whereas a glass half full view does a full accounting of all the awesome things or people or circumstances that you do have, a glass half empty view, at the same time it neglects all of that, would pull out a magnifying glass to seek fault. And when we seek fault, we find fault. 
Uh, if no fault is found with a magnifying glass, uh, uh, if we're looking for what we don't have, then we pull out a microscope. And then certainly we're gonna find fault in ourselves, our lives, our partners, and everything else that we actually do have. What this means is that a glass half full view is appreciative. A glass half empty view is negative and cynical. That's no path to happiness. Paths to happiness, peace, and love, which I'm just gonna assume you want, will always go through where the glass is half full. There is no path to happiness that goes through where the glass is half empty. So you can love the car that you do have. Many people do, though their car is older and in worse shape than yours. If you don't have a car, you can love the bicycle you do have. If you don't have a bicycle, you can love the shoes you do have. And that's where you find the peace and the happiness. We can imagine a monk halfway around the world with only the robes on his back. He's renounced all worldly possessions. He's got robes that look exactly as fashionable as every other monk's. And he's happy. He's happy because he's doing a full accounting of all that he does have, like the health he does have, the life he does have, the food he does have, the air he does have to breathe. He's not looking at the latest Ferrari, wishing he had that instead of his happiness. In contrast to the monk, let's imagine that somewhere else in the world, there's a billionaire who suddenly got very unhappy with the yacht he has because Larry Ellison just sailed by in a much bigger yacht. I'm sure that's happened to a billionaire. It's not the absolute amount of wealth or stuff that you have that is going to make you happy because there's always going to be someone who has more. I mean, I don't even have a yacht. My car is almost two decades old, but I love my car anyway. And that's a path to loving the car that I do have, though it doesn't have a Ferrari logo on it. Now, the, the reality is that the glass we're talking about is simultaneously half full and half empty. We're not talking about any change in the material universe. We're talking about a change in perspective. Now, one of the better parts about finding happiness with changes in perspective is that changes in perspective happen instantaneously. You flick your eyes away from the emptiness on the top half of the glass where you have to hallucinate stuff because you can't see anything there anyway, and you flick it down to the half of the glass that does contain the whole point of the glass or the substance you can take action on, and that, that happens in a split second. This means you, you don't have to wait before you've changed or have healed. You don't have to wait for some kind of milestone. You don't have to wait for something to have happened in the world out there before you find peace or happiness. Changes in perspective happen instantaneously. And that's what makes them so powerful. If a change in perspective gets the job done, then no change to your material circumstances will be necessary. I'll use my car as another example. As long as I keep appreciating the car that I have and loving the car that I have, it's going to one day be three decades old and I'm going to be fine with it. Um, if I appreciate the shoes that I do have, I don't have any need at all to go buy another pair of shoes. And then, you know, though these are not worn, you know, to, to try to find happiness in another pair of shoes. Often we believe that to have happiness, we have to be a whole different person, or we need a whole other life. And many self-help gurus really play on this idea that you have to transform yourself, or that you need to transform your life before you're happy, or before you find satisfaction. That's a very long and not so easy journey. I would encourage you to seek changes in perspective. I would encourage you to keep flicking your eyes from all that stuff that you don't have, that you might want, but that you don't have, to do a full accounting of and appreciation of all that you do have. I'll use a few more examples from my personal life. I, I have way too many watches. I have way too many multi-tools. I have way too many pocket knives. It's not that there was anything wrong with the first watch that I bought, which still keeps time, you know, well enough, or the first multi-tool or Swiss army knife that I bought. It just is, I neglected what I did have 
And then I kept looking at what I don't have. And of course, if you keep looking at what you don't have, you're gonna trick yourself into thinking, well, I, I, I need this watch with this color of dial to fit this one outfit that I'm gonna wear once in the next 10 years. Um, or what if I get stranded in the wilderness and my multi-tool doesn't have a hammer, so I gotta go buy a multi-tool with a hammer. I have fallen prey to this way of thinking, this glass half empty way of thinking too. So I hope I'm not coming across as moralistic. It is simply practical to look at all that you do have, to appreciate all that you do have. So like, let's say my multi-tool collection were more visible to me and not just in a drawer in a desk somewhere. I would probably be at least a few hundred to a few thousand dollars richer today just by having more of a visible multi-tool collection. One, one thing that I want to come back around to is the idea that a glass half full view makes you complacent, that it prevents you from pursuing more or, or wanting more or doing more. When I think about those who are grateful for all that they do have and they keep paying attention to and caring for all that they do have, then all that they do have is nurtured. So if, if they care for the relationships they do have, if they're appreciative of the relationships they do have, those relationships flourish. Um, if they love the car they do have, then they drive the car carefully enough and they bring it to the mechanic and they, they get it waxed or washed and taken care of once in a while because they appreciate what they do have. So I want to come back around to the possible objection you might raise, that to take a glass half full view and then to account for all that we have without looking at all that we don't have, that that's going to necessarily lead to complacency or stagnation. It's true, we can't all be monks in a monastery wearing robes because, you know, your office probably has a dress code of some kind. Um, the restaurants you go to, if you don't want to be stared at, you probably want to wear, you know, something fitting for the restaurant, and it might not already be in your wardrobe. Because the glass half full, glass half empty debate is often presented as this dichotomy, where either the glass is half full or the glass is half empty. You might have the idea that you are necessarily gonna be complacent and you're not gonna um, want to move forward or have more or accomplish more or do more when you do a full accounting of all that you do have. Um, th that's not really the situation where it's necessarily a dichotomy or that it's gonna make you complacent. Um, it is completely compatible with a view of life as essentially a glass that's half full to also want to build upon your blessings, to take all that you do have and then want more of the good things for yourself and, and for those around you. So let's say that I found the perfect multi-tool and then I, I buy that one multi-tool and it doesn't have a hammer. And I actually am in a situation where I need a multi-tool with a hammer, then I, I don't think that it's unappreciative of the one multi-tool I have to go buy a second multi-tool that does have a hammer on it. The thing I want to bring your attention to is that um, probably you aren't so parsimonious in your choices. Probably in some way you have noticed that you do have an excess of whatever it is is your thing. For me, it's like watches and multi-tools. For you, it, it, it might be camera equipment. For, for you, it might be guitars or synthesizers. For, for you, it might be, I mean, anything that could be accumulated when what you already have is in enough. I certainly know there are quite a number of subcultures on the internet that use the phrase gear acquisition syndrome. And in, in my view, uh, so-called gas gear acquisition syndrome is an effect of neglecting what you do have and making the most out of what you do have and loving and taking care of what you do have. If 
you have enough money and if it makes you happy, I'm not actually stopping you from going and buying as much of the stuff that you want, that, 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 that you actually do want. But I also know that many of the listeners to this podcast have been on that treadmill before and they want more because there's always a newer model. There's always a salesman at, at, at the shop who wants you to get more stuff or the latest stuff. There's always you taking a peek at the industry magazines and seeing that th there's a new technology that makes the old technology obsolete. I'm giving you a, a way off the treadmill. The, the, the way to hit the stop button, right, is to take your eye off of all that you don't have, even if it is new. And put your attention on all that you do have, even though you already do have it, even if it might be an older model. There are plenty of happy and grateful people who are still motivated, who are still driven, who still want to get stuff done. Perhaps the photographer with one or two camera bodies and no more than that, and then maybe like a couple primes and one zoom lens, Maybe then, if they've acquired enough equipment, they can go out and shoot. They can actually use the equipment they do have, rather than just looking at more camera equipment, hoping that that's their path to better photos. So a full accounting of all that you do have, especially when it reveals that you already have enough, I believe is totally compatible with, and indeed a segue into, making full use of all that you have because the point of life is not just to acquire stuff. One tip I'll give for how to connect with where the glass is half full is that you'll have to take your inner critic, that incessant nagging voice of negativity, and I'll have you imagine you're stuffing it into a box. We're labeling that box devil's advocate do not trust, not your conscience, not a truth teller, do not believe, has no taste. Because your inner critic does one thing only. It criticizes. That's what it does. It can't appreciate. It can't love. It criticizes. And of course, if you don't find anything to fault with a magnifying glass, you're going to pull out a microscope and then you're going to find it. So I encourage you to put your inner critic in that box to recognize that it's no source of truth or good taste. And to then connect with your thoughts that do appreciate, your thoughts that do love. To, to connect with your thoughts that look at what you have and then want you to make the most out of it. To kind of take the conversation away from the accumulation of um, equipment and gear to some more practical real life examples. I'm going to apply this concept of look at where the glass is half full to, to, to a number of different situations that, that, that are more emotional in nature. Um, the, the first one is when you are stressed, right? So under stress, often there's a feeling that you don't have enough time. You don't have enough resources. You don't have enough capability. You, you don't have enough of, of, of something. Yet I'll point out to you, that every time you had that feeling before, at the end of the day, you were back in bed falling asleep and your life continued the next day. You didn't have everything, no one does, but you still had enough that, that life continued. Under stress, when you're telling yourself that you don't have enough time, you don't have enough money, you don't have enough resources, that's the person in the kitchen with a full fridge who then has to start to think about what she does have and then to figure out how to apply some ingenuity and put together the ingredients to make what one can make with what they do have. Another example is the fear of public speaking, which often follows from the idea that maybe you don't have enough to say or maybe someone's going to ask you a question and you don't know the answer. But here's the thing. Everyone has infinite things that they don't know the answer to. And everyone also, by looking at what they can talk about, 
has enough to do at least a 20 or 30 minute presentation about their, their work or, or themselves, or they can speak on behalf of a best friend. So in the context of public speaking, you probably don't want to imagine someone asking you a question where you literally don't have the answer and then you're blurting out whatever comes to mind. It's legitimate to say, I don't know. Capable, knowledgeable professionals say, I don't know, all the time because sometimes that's the only correct answer. And that's part of where the glass is half full. That I don't know is a legitimate answer or we don't have the data yet or I'll have to get back to you on that. These are legitimate answers. But often you never have to say it because if you speak comprehensively enough about all that you do know, if, if you do a deep dive into where you are an expert, which is kind of the reason people ask you to do public speaking as an adult anyway, well, then you're going to fill the time. You'll, you'll have kept the topic on track enough that whatever questions arise are questions you're able to answer. So if you have a fear of public speaking, quite possibly you are thinking you have to know everything or answer everything. You do not. Keeping your attention fixed on what you do know, the expertise you do have, the insights or analysis that you have, which got you the speaking invitation in the first place, you're going to do just fine. Another more emotional example that I just kind of picked out of a hat is exercise motivation. So I'll just pause for a moment to let you, the listener, uh, reflect upon this to see if you can figure out how can you apply this concept of the glass being half full to exercise motivation. Well, one is that you might not be able to lift, say, 200 pounds as a deadlift, but whatever you can lift is a very good starting point for your exercise routine. You might not be able to run on the treadmill for a full hour like someone who's been running for 10 years, but you might be able to run on the treadmill for 10 minutes, and if that's enough to get your heart racing and your lungs breathing deeply and your muscles taxed somewhat, that's a good enough starting point. Many people are kind of intimidated when they look at going to the gym because they're looking at where the glass is half empty. They're, they're, they're looking at what they don't have. They're looking at what that person has and, and the, what, that, that they themselves don't have, which is, I'm going to say, an incorrect view of the gym because that's going to keep you away from the gym. And people who are on the treadmill for an hour or, or who can deadlift like two or 300 pounds did not start there. They got up to that point. Another example I'm going to give is when you feel inadequate in a relationship. So here are some points to look at in the half of the glass that's full. One is that your partner chose you. I'm assuming that they're perceptive enough to see you as you are. And if they see you as you are and they deem you adequate enough to be in a relationship with you, I mean, that's... That's good enough. So accounting for your partner's view of you is in the half of the glass that's full. Um, another place to look is in the attractiveness you do have. So if you're looking in the mirror, don't look at the one blemish that's going away in five days anyway. If you have good eyes, look at your eyes. <laughs> if you have good lips, look at your lips. Because certainly your partner is looking to those places when they look at you. Another part of where the glass is half full is let's say you're worried about the career that you have, right? So let's say your partner makes more money than you, or let's say that they have a more prestigious career than you. The outside perspective on a career definitely sees where the glass is half full, right? So if we look at a doctor, we're thinking, okay, well, they have prestige, they make money, they save lives, that's where the glass is half full. An inside view of the profession looks at all how busy they are, how many hospital administrators they now have to deal with. It looks at the student debt they had to go into to get into medical school. The outside view is, is usually a glass half full view. So if you kind of take an outside view of your career, 
right? So let's say you're not a doctor, but let's say that you have reasonable hours. Let's say you didn't have to go into debt to fund your education before making your first dollar in salary. Um, let's say that you never risk someone with Ebola coughing or vomiting on you. That's in the half of the glass that is full if you're not a doctor. So, so this practice of turning away from where the glass is half empty to very intentionally and almost to develop tunnel vision for where the glass is half full, it's, it's counterintuitive. It's not easy for most people to do, which is why I decided to make this episode about it. But it's also universally applicable once you start to do it. When I was first introduced to the concept of gratitude, I completely dismissed and poo-pooed it. So the person who first explained in depth to me the concept of being grateful for all that you do have was, I believe it was Linda Gabriel, um, a hypnotherapist in Los Angeles who I co-wrote a book with. And I was 21 years old, I believe. Um, and I could see she has a nice office in Hollywood and that she has a celebrity clientele. So at the back of my mind, I thought, well, it's easy for you to say that you should be grateful for all that you have because, I mean, look at your life. There's a lot for you to be grateful for. And then look at my life. I, you know, I, I'm down here in, in L.A. And by the way, I actually got hit by an SUV turning out of the Paramount lot when I went to Los Angeles. So I got hit by an SUV. I, I didn't actually go to the hospital. It was just like a, a little scrape. And I was 21 years old with probably a negative um, net worth at that time. How could I be grateful? What could I be grateful for? Well, today, two decades later, I can come up with some pretty good answers. One, it's not every new English literature grad who gets flown to Los Angeles to interview someone and then to write a book with them. But I was in that situation and that's how I got, well, scraped by an SUV turning out of the Paramount lot. Two, I had the, 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 the intellect and the capabilities and the work ethic to make something of myself. Even at the age of 21, I was out of university already, and not everyone I went to high school with went to university. I was in a situation where my parents paid for my university tuition. Even though I didn't have any money at the time, I had much earning potential once we do a full accounting of where the glass is half full. I could speak the English language, which means that I have access to one of the bigger markets for the book if it, it had taken off. And I, I could be a hypnotherapist to plausibly half a billion native speakers and certainly more than a billion second language English speakers. I also had at the time my youth and good health and a long timeline looking into the future. Um, I, I had at the time you know, some modest material goods. So I had a guitar. Um, if I actually just played the thing rather than buying a whole bunch more guitars thinking that that would motivate me to eventually learn how to play the guitar, I might actually be able to play the guitar today. I don't remember whether I was seeing anyone at the time, but I definitely had friends in Toronto and they count among all that I have. Um, the weather was good when I went to Los Angeles. And I could keep going on and on like this. At the age of 21, I couldn't see any of this. I could just see, you know, my own poverty and, you know, relative to this person who seemed to have a lot. But now it's like the tables have turned and now it's like I'm the person with a nice office. I'm the person who seems wealthy. But if you're more like the younger me, then my message to you is that you certainly have much in the half of the glass that is full. And it is worth looking there to find happiness. It's worth looking there to find peace of mind. It's worth looking there to find the most lovable parts of you or your life. It's worth looking there to see your future. 
because that's where you're going to find the ingredients out of which you'll make your future. Thank you for listening to this episode. Both I and my co-host Pascal are available for hire through the Morpheus Clinic for Hypnosis in Toronto, Canada. Just go to morphysclinic.com and ask for a free consultation. Because it's not always simple, intuitive, or straightforward to tear your eyes away from where the glass is half empty and force yourself to look at where the glass is half full, you can hire us to do that for you. We're practical philosophers at heart. Essentially, what we do is we think on our client's behalf and we communicate that thinking to them. For more episodes like this, search for How to Be an Adult on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts, or subscribe to us on YouTube at Morpheus Hypnosis. Thank you again for listening.